Before we begin, a quick message from our sponsor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will even distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many more other platforms. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. There's everything you need in a podcast in one place. So go ahead and download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of the World Today podcast. In today's podcast, we have a very special guest from Toronto and he is a Toronto City Councillor and his name is Gordon Perks. So Mr. Perks, how are you doing today? I'm very well, how are you? I'm good, thank you for asking. So Mr. Perks, tell us about yourself. Well, I'm a Toronto City Councillor. I've been doing that for about 12 years, uh, 13 years now, I guess. Uh, before that, I worked in the environmental movement for about 20 years. Wow. So I prepared some great questions and concerning questions of residents living in Toronto and my audience. And we, I'd like to ask you, my first question would be, as a Torontonian myself, it is important to me that I do my part to help the environment. So what do you believe each Torontonian can do on an individual scale on a day-to-day -day basis to help the environment and to control their own carbon footprint and the city, to help the city? Well, there are things that individuals can do uh, by not relying on the private automobile, uh, making sure that the home you live in, uh, whether you rent or own, is as energy efficient as possible. These are important steps, but even more important, if we are going to solve the climate crisis and we're going to become an energy efficient and sustainable society, we can only do that if we work together. You can't get there just by each person doing their own actions. So the thing each of us needs to do is to participate more in our society by being an advocate for governments to change. It's that political work that we do together that is the most important thing you can spend your time on joining a community organization, volunteering for a neighborhood association, getting involved in politics, doing something in your school or in your workplace. This is where we'll really make a difference. For sure, yes. <clears throat> so, so do you believe that Torontonians who live in a house should install solar panels? It, it all depends. Uh, there are circumstances where it's right and circumstances where it's wrong. Rather than looking for one specific thing that you can uh, say, this is what I need to do, we need to all think about everything we do in our lives uh, in terms of whether uh, that's a sustainable activity. If your home is not uh, energy efficient at this point, there are probably a dozen different things you can do, and it would depend on your specific circumstances whether a solar panel would be the right thing for you. The city can help homeowners look at what their options are, um, or if you're a tenant, creating a, a tenants group and advocating for more energy efficiency from the landlord, these are some steps you might take. Yeah. Uh, as a former tenant in an apartment building in Scarborough and uh, Toronto, I've learned that tenants, uh, buildings that were made in the 1970s lack uh, environmental uh, uh, you know, precautions. So what, what would you, what can we do to like, you know, let people and residents of uh, tenants and like tenants, landlords know our concerns? Well, the thing I like to say is that there's always strength in numbers. Uh, if you are a tenant, the, the most important thing to do is to talk to other tenants and form a tenant association. We've had remarkable success with some tenant organizations in the city of Toronto, uh, inventing new ways to reduce the amount of waste and garbage that they generate in their buildings, uh, forcing landlords to make uh, investments to stop the building from leaking heat because every time you've got a cold draft in a building, that means energy is leaving the building. So you make yourself more comfortable and you save the environment at the same time. 
But again, if you try to do this each person by themselves, it won't work. So number is the key thing. Yes, all of us working together is how we're going to get out of this mess. <clears throat> so what is the city of Toronto doing to help with climate change? The city of Toronto uh, is actually one of the leaders worldwide in dealing with the climate crisis among municipalities. A lot of people don't know this, but the first climate tar- uh, change reduction targets in the world were the Toronto targets that were passed in 1988. And that uh, led to international agreements like the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Accord. So Toronto municipalities have a long history of being leaders here. Uh, The City of Toronto also has a very ambitious climate plan to try to reduce the amount of uh, greenhouse gases we put out each year until we arrive at what we call net zero by 2050. The plan focuses mostly on the two main things that happen in cities that cause climate change, transportation, driving your car or how you get around the city, and heating of buildings. Uh, Heating of buildings both where you live and where you work. Right now, we heat most of our buildings with natural gas, and that's an enormous contributor to climate change. We give uh, subsidies to new buildings. We uh, have a home energy program (coughs) to help people retrofit existing buildings. We spend money uh, making deep retrofits in the buildings that the city of Toronto owns itself. So... Transportation and heating are the two things we do most, but we also work on all kinds of other issues, uh, building our cycling infrastructure, changing how we plan our city, changing how we pump water for our, uh, our drinking water system. Everything that we do, we now turn our eyes to how can we do this in a more energy efficient way. Absolutely. And I hope that GTA, uh, other towns in the GTA or around the world can look at Toronto as a role model for climate change and, you know, act, what Tor- act upon what Toronto is doing. <clears throat> well, one of the so, things that we did, one of the things that we did as a city years ago was to create a fund called the Toronto Atmospheric Fund to help uh, individuals, businesses and so on innovate around how to reduce their climate impact. And in the last couple of years, we brought all the other GTA municipalities in to share in that program. Yeah. So that uh, climate change is really important for us. And it's one of the biggest concerns uh, for uh, elections, too. But another concern is homelessness. And so there are approximately 5,000 people in Toronto who are homeless and nearly 3,200 people on the wait list for supportive housing. How is Toronto helping with the rising issue with homeless people? Well, we're doing a number of things. I don't think it's anywhere near enough. Um, The city of Toronto uh, has just recently passed a housing plan to uh, create many, many thousands of affordable housing units over the next 10 years, but it's not going to be enough. Uh, Frankly, we need to change the way we think as a society so we recognize that housing is a human right, that part of the dignity of being alive is getting a place to live. Uh, that, that's going to take us a lot of work. I think yes. we start, though, by investing public money. Forty years ago, 50 years ago, the Canadian and Ontario and Toronto governments directly spent money creating social housing. When I say social housing, that means housing that's directly delivered by government, housing delivered by not-for-profits, and housing that is for co-ops. We used to just put public money into building those things, and we stopped. Slowly but surely, we've been talking about bringing back that kind of public investment. We need to do that on an urgent basis right now. Absolutely, because of the rising homeless people, we need to think about not just our, ourselves, but the people that don't, you know, have the same things like we do. It's important. Yes, it is. 
So the main concern, our next issue is TDC. And personally, this is one of my concerns too. So how will the rise in TDC fare affect ridership? Well, when you push the price of transit up, you lose, uh, you lose riders. Um, and you can see the effect of this. The transit ridership hasn't kept up with the increase in population for probably five years now because we keep increasing uh, the cost of riding transit. So that, that's a, a bit of a mistake. Uh, it's not something that I agree with. I think that we need to uh, recognize that transit has benefits for all of us, whether we individually take transit or not. If you're uh, a business owner, public transit helps your employees and customers get to your business. If you drive a car, public transit means that other people are not driving their cars so the roads aren't congested. If you uh, want to breathe clean air, public transit helps to make the air cleaner for you. So we all benefit when there's public transit, and that's why we should be increasing the amount that the municipal government and other governments pay towards public transit instead of getting so much of the money from fares. For sure. Um, I mean, as the environmental concern, if you're linking this back to climate change, Toronto is doing a great job introducing electric buses. And uh, <clears throat> so if there is, if people, if the TDC raises their fares, they lose a certain amount of uh, ridership and that can affect the environment too, right? Yes, absolutely. You don't need it. You don't need the TTC to be electric to recognize the benefits. Getting more people to share how they travel, more people on a bus or a streetcar or a subway, even without new vehicles, each of those new riders benefits society as a whole. For sure. So the next big issue is not just my issue, but a lot of my peers. This is one of the biggest issues Toronto is facing. And when I mean the biggest, it is one of the biggest issues. The rise of violence in Toronto, it's, it's one of the biggest issues. What is the city of Toronto doing to reduce this violence? Well, here's something where I don't agree with most people on council. Most of what we have been spending our money on is on policing, hiring more uh, police officers to try to... Uh, you know, police crime and, and try to stop it that way. All of the evidence shows that policing, while it may help to catch people who have committed crimes, is a, not a good tool for preventing the crimes from happening in the first place. To do that, you need to invest in programs, particularly programs that help uh, what we call socially marginalized youth to be more included in our society. What we mean by that is there are people sometimes because of uh, how they've been racialized in our society or because they've grown up in poverty who are not uh, getting access to the same level of social inclusion and support that wealthier or white people might get. So what all the evidence tells us to do is to invest in those programs that prevent violence by investing in young people, particularly racialized young people. And Toronto hasn't been doing enough of that because there's been too much of an emphasis of putting the money into police. So you believe that if we introduce better programs to the youth, this can lower the violence itself? And it's not just me that believes that. Uh, several years ago, the province of Ontario uh, did the most detailed and in-depth study about why we have violence in our society of any government that I'm aware of. Uh, it's called the Roots of Youth Violence. And it found very clearly that investing in programs uh, that help racialized and low-income youth uh, get better resources, better supports, and be more included in our society is the best way to prevent violence from spreading in a society. I completely agree with you. If you look at affluent societies around the world or in Canada, you can see that there's barely any violence. But if you look at uh, non-affluent societies, such as the lower parts of Scarborough or uh, some parts of Scarborough where there is uh, poverty there, you can see the violence difference from affluent societies and non-affluent societies. So, 
<clears throat> our next issue is cycling. So other Canadian cities such as Vancouver, Montreal, top the list of being the most cyclist-friendly cities. Do you think that it's important that Toronto expands on the existing accommodations for the cyclists of the cities to add a more environmental and cheaper alternative, more mode of transport for the citizens of Toronto? Absolutely. Cycling is a key part of how we are, as a society are going to make our transition to being more sustainable. It's also just a better use of the scarce uh, resources we have. No, we're not going to be able to build any more roads in Toronto. There's just nowhere to put them. So we have to use the road space that we have better. And that means uh, trying to emphasize those modes of transportation that don't use as much of our road space. And those modes are walking, cycling, and public transit. The one that uses too much road space is, of course, the car. So if we uh, can build better bicycle infrastructure, we're allowing more people to travel efficiently within the city of Toronto, and we are... Uh, helping the environment we're meeting both of those goals for sure <clears throat> so um one of the another big issue is the price in housing i mean my family <coughs> my family moved from scarborough because they couldn't afford a house in scarborough because of the prices of the house i mean a bungalow costs around seven to eight hundred thousand dollars and in ajax where i live now costs around uh, a, a two-story apart, a two-story building. Uh, I mean, a two-story house with two garages. Uh, a four-bedroom house costs less than a, a, around eight hundred thousand, around the same price for a bungalow in Toronto. So, I believe the foreign investors are one of the main reasons housing is getting less affordable in Toronto. What is Toronto doing to combat this? I don't believe that the issue is uh, just strictly foreign investors. I think it's what we call the financialization of housing. And by that, I mean uh, that housing is more and more a for-profit activity that people speculate on. And many of those speculators are right here in Canada. We also uh, increasingly tell people uh, to go and take on big mortgages if you want to live in Toronto. Well, someone's making money off that mortgage. It's the bank. If instead we did what happens in places like Vienna or Stockholm or Berlin, or Glasgow, where most of the housing uh, is that social housing that is either provided directly by the government or through not-for-profits not or co-ops, you take the profit out of the system. The, you don't have banks or large financial institutions investing in our housing and driving up the cost of living in our housing. Instead, that investment cost, we all bear together because it's paid for socially rather than privately. That's the model we need to get to if we are going to reduce the house, the cost of housing and have a society where people from all incomes can find somewhere comfortable to live in the city of Toronto. So what, 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 is, what initiatives is the uh, city of Toronto doing to uh, help people with <coughs> affordable housing? We have some initiatives, but I, I think that we are not putting enough into directly building and buying housing as the government uh, used to do uh, 40 and 50 years ago. That's where we really fall down on the job. <clears throat> we keep hoping that the private sector will, will solve the housing problem, even though it's very obvious that relying on the private sector has made things worse, not better. So we need government intervention, right? Yes, we need government to be to be leading the construction of affordable housing directly. For sure. So my last question is to you. What are some new policies that you want the people in the city to be aware of? And not just the city, but the GTA. Well, I don't I don't know that there's a, a specific set of policies that I want to highlight to people. What I instead want to, to talk about uh, to, to conclude the, the conversation is the deep importance of individual people getting involved in these issues. Um, it's great that we live in a, in, a, 
in a place where we get to elect our governments, but just electing me or somebody else and sending them down to city hall and say, do your best, that's not going to be enough. We have to get involved in community organizations, in activist groups, uh, in, in neighborhood groups, uh, get involved in our workplaces and our schools to build political movements that demand that we get a more equal, environmentally sustainable and affordable city for all of us to share. Absolutely. And I also believe that everyone should be contributing to society. For, for example, I'm contributing to society by doing this podcast where I inform the residents about the initiatives Toronto is doing so they can be more aware of. Very so, good. Be proud of that work. It's important. Thank you so much. So, Mr. Gordon Perks, thank you so much for being on my podcast. I really appreciate it. You're actually my first politician I interviewed. Oh, the, well, I hope you get a lot more. Thank you so much. And Take care. Thank Have a great day. Thank you for watching another episode of the World Today podcast, and I'll see you guys next week.